I'm going to help you connect the dots on that, okay? Because the I am stuff ought to ring a bell to you. I'm going to help you make the connection. Because if you go all the way back, I won't ask you to turn there, but if you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, in chapter 3, when, when God appeared to Moses at the, at the burning bush, when God appeared as he, he was there, and told Moses to go to Pharaoh to, to let my people go, Moses asked God, well, well, who shall I say sent me? And do you remember what God said? He said, tell them that I am. Tell them that I am. That's who, that's who has sent you. Who sent you is I am. And Jesus now, if you will, filling in, the, filling in the blank. Okay, I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the shepherd. Jesus narrates God. The word became flesh. And Jesus describes, illustrates, narrates, exegetes God is what he does. This shouldn't surprise you, I hope, if you remember at Mount Carmel, that, uh, that we would see Jesus fulfilling what we saw back in Exodus because we all know that Scripture is, after all, one comprehensive story about Jesus Christ from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, everything in between. So it shouldn't be a surprise to us when we see something like that. But it ought to amaze us, though, and once again give us that certainty and assurance that what we read is nothing less than the inspired Word of God. Now he says in verses 49 and 50, Jesus does, he says, you know, your forefathers, they ate manna, bread from, from heaven, they ate that in the desert, but, but they all died. But here in me, he says, is the bread that came down from heaven. And if anyone eats this bread, he'll live forever. If you, if you eat this bread, eat this, you will live forever. The second thing I want us to notice about this statement about the bread of life is the significance of that metaphor and the eating of this bread. So, so important to see. Because bread, of course, as we saw, it's symbolic of all food, is it not? Bread is, bread is a basic form of, of sustenance. It's a, it's, it's a basic, the basic stuff that we absolutely need, require to live. We can't live without food, without, without bread. You, you can't live without it. And, and I think that's a very simple connection to make. I don't think I need to make it any further. Because, but, but let me make sure that we get the full flavor of this metaphor, okay? Because, because uh, especially as it relates to our eating of the bread, because it's the eating, Jesus says, that gives us eternal life. And eating is suggestive of a few things, okay? Eating is necessary. It's a necessary... You have to eat. If I'm going to take a piece of bread and get any advantage out of it at all, I, I have to eat it, don't I? If I don't, what good is it? I could look at it, I could analyze it, I could admire it, I could squeeze it, I could smell it, but unless I eat it, I won't be nourished by it. It's impossible. And so, so maybe that's not rocket science, but let me make the point of application. The same is true with Christ. The exact same thing is true. I may know the truth about him, I may admire him, I may respect him, but if I don't receive him, he does me absolutely no good. What good is it then? Eating is a response to the most basic of human needs, namely our hunger. And so if you're, if you're hungry, you know innately to go and get food. Okay? Spiritually, though, if you don't understand that you have hunger, if you're not awakened to it, how do you know to go and look for Christ? Eating is a basic necessity. Regardless then of any of our objections we may have had in the past, regardless of how old you might be, how long it's, how stubborn you've been, how much you've dug your heels in, doesn't, doesn't matter. Because once we recognize our hunger, we automatically go to the source of food that gives life, Jesus Christ. Bread is necessary. Jesus is necessary. It's an act, eating is, of appropriation. The table may be spread with all sorts of fare and beautiful bread, but until I take it in and digest it, it doesn't become a part of me. It doesn't become a source of energy for me. And, and if I don't eat it, I'll shrivel up and I'll die. Okay? 
The same's true spiritually. Same's true with Christ. If I don't take him in and make him a part of me, death. Death. Again, I might respect his personality. I may tremble at the sight of it. I may cry, weep at the thought of him hanging on the cross. But until I appropriate him as mine, I am not having life. Eating is a personal act as well. No one can eat for you. There's no such thing as proxy eating. You actually actually have to sit down or stand up and take the food, take the bread, and put it into your mouth and chew it and digest it. No one can do that for you. The same is true spiritually. It doesn't matter if your mom was a believer. It doesn't matter if your dad was or if your pastor is. It doesn't matter. Because I can't can't believe for you. Mom can't believe for you. You must do this yourself. So eating is a personal act. You must eat the bread. I am the bread of life that's come down from heaven. And those words have caused the crowd to grumble and stumble over what he said. Now, now they're, they're stewing about this, and instead of, instead of him breaking down his statement and explaining exactly what he means, Jesus adds even more fuel to the fire by shocking them with what he says in verse 51. He says this, he says, This bread I'm talking about, this bread is my flesh. Oh, which I'll give for the life of the world. I can only imagine the sorts of things going through their heads now. now, So so they're grumbling, and he says, okay, this bread, this bread is my flesh. That's outrageous. That's radical. That's, uh, that's disturbing. And it says that the Jews argued sharply among themselves. They, they fought with each other. It was, it's a strong verb. They fought with each other. You know, any dullard can see Jesus wasn't talking about, about eating his body, okay? He, he wasn't talking about cannibalism, okay? Anybody can see that. They, they weren't talking about that. But, but if he's talking metaphorically, what does he mean? And they, they argued about that. What could he possibly mean when he says he's the bread and the bread's his flesh? What does he, what does he mean by that? How can he give us his flesh to eat? What in the world is he talking about? Who does he think he is? Now, now, in answer to that argument, Jesus, once again, doesn't explain it. He doesn't break it down and make it easy. He throws the whole can of gas on the fire. And he, he blows the whole thing up, is what he does. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. He knows, that he knows they're arguing, and they're shocked by what he said, and now they're just going to become outraged. He says this, I tell you the truth, unless, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood. Now, now trying to figure out what eating the flesh was all about was problematic enough, but, but drinking the blood, that was just outright scandal to the Jews, because the laws of God severely restrict, prohibited any drinking of any blood. Okay, even, even meat that had blood in it, they, they couldn't eat that meat. So, so eating, drinking blood was, was just, uh, was horrible, horrific for them. Every Jew knew it was against the law to do that. And they would remember the warnings that God gave back in Leviticus about this that we studied two years ago, Leviticus 17. Chapter 17, verse 10. Any Israelite or any alien living among them who eats my blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut them off from his people. So it was the prohibition. Nobody in their right mind would would drink the blood. Scandalous thing to say. And Jesus says it in order to scandalize them. He does it to shock them, to shake them, to wake them up, and make them ready to see what was about to happen in his life at the cross. If you simply go one more verse in Leviticus, to Leviticus 17, 11, you'll read this. This is why God prohibited the blood to be, to be drank. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I've given it to you to make atonement. To make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Remember we said atonement means at one mint with God. That whole, the whole sacrificial system that we read about in Leviticus, there's always blood to give life at, at one mint. So the, the blood was prohibited to be, to be eaten, to be drank because it was for the purpose of atonement. 
who gives that atonement? And who gives that atonement by his blood? It is none other than Jesus Christ. Once again, the Word made flesh explains God. The Word made flesh narrates God, shows God. And once again, it's not a surprise that we would see Jesus offering his blood for atonement. And we see this in Leviticus because, once again, everybody knows that the Bible is one comprehensive story about Jesus Christ from beginning to end. And even the sacrificial system that we learned about two years ago in Leviticus was all pointing toward Jesus Christ. Here he fulfills that. The atonement made in my blood. He explains, explicates, exegetes God. So when he makes that scandalous claim that whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, I'll raise him up on the last day for my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. We understand exactly what he means. And we are scandalized by it. We are changed by it radically and irreversibly. You see, just as as man died spiritually in the garden by eating something he was not supposed to, you remember that story in Adam and Eve? You know, they ate something they weren't supposed to. They died spiritually. And so too now, man will eat, and he will be given life spiritually, eternally. Once again, you see that Jesus completes the story. The eating that gave death is now turned, redeemed into eating that gives life what Jesus Christ does. He explains God. All of Scripture points directly to Jesus Christ. Jesus here is not teaching us about some kind of mysterious meal in which someone takes a piece of bread and magically transforms it into his body. He is not teaching that. He is not teaching that someone can take a cup of wine or a cup of juice and say a prayer over it and magically transform that into the blood of Jesus. He is not saying that at all. That is erroneous. It's a mistake. Forget about it. It's not that. This is a spiritual teaching for spiritual life, eternal life. See, it's not not a dead Christ that a sinner is made alive again. It's the live Christ. And when we celebrate the death of that one who gives life, we have life in us. And his death becomes our death. Our life becomes his life. And this scandal of the bread, this scandal of how we're given new life, is that the one who was without sin dies for our sin. And when we celebrate that act, we celebrate the life we've been given. And so today, I'll ask you in your hearts, will you be scandalized by that? Will you be changed by that? Will you be transformed by that? Will you feed on this bread of life that is Jesus Christ? Will you do that? I pray that you will. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Your word that appears on different levels to be scandalous. But they are words of life. Words that that sew together the whole story of your redemptive plan. You've been telling the story from the beginning of time. You've pointed toward it, and then you fulfilled it in Jesus Christ. I thank you that you've given us your word to be able to see that, that your purposes that you set out to to achieve have been accomplished in full in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, help us to, uh, to not only see that, but to feed on that, to understand the truth of it and be changed by it. Father, make us amazed by it. Uh, let us listen and, and hear you and be taught by you that we would come to believe and have life Father, I pray for this congregation that you would give us listening hearts and ears and a hunger to be nourished by your word. Father, help us to be able to connect the dots together to understand how true your word is and that it's a word of life. It's the word of life. 
Father, we pray for our church members today, those who've come to visit with us, families here, families uh, who've not joined us. Praying certainly, Lord, for the family of Elaine, our friend who uh, went home to be with you this past week. Thanking you for her life, for her gifts and her blessings. Asking you, Lord, to, uh, to comfort her family and friends as they mourn her passing. 